Patanjali Yoga of Prison you can find in Swami Vivekananda's complete works. Actually it was Swami Vivekananda who tried to popularize the Patanjali Yoga of Prison. In the Raja Yoga book, Swamiji wrote this Raja Yoga book, wrote, wrote means he did not write in his own handwriting. He dictated those things. And Waldo, uh, Sarah Ellen Waldo, she wrote those books. It was funny how it came out. <coughs> it came out in a funny way. Swami Vivekananda would crawl, you know. He walked from one corner to the another corner of the hall or in the room. And Waldo would sit with pen, ink pot and the paper. In that time, you know, the pen was in the ink pot and it had to be deep inside and then they had to write. So she, what she did, she dipped those uh, pain inside the ink pot and waited when Swami Vivekananda would dictate. Sometimes 15 minutes, half an hour, Swami did not dictate any single word. He was respond. And when it came out from his mouth, like one page at a time. It was very difficult to write such a fast, such a fast, uh, uh, you know, pace. So it was the, uh, uh, so Raj Yoga book came out first when Swami Vivekananda was in uh, New York in uh, 1895, around 1895 it came out. So, um, in Raja Yoga book you can find in the beginning there is uh, Patanjali Yoga person and the second part of the book is uh, Swami, sorry, first part is Swami Vivekananda Raja Yoga and the second part is uh, Patanjali Yoga person. Raja Yoga actually it was connected with Tantra, Raja Yoga was there. But this Raja Yoga, it is Swamiji's completely own contribution, completely own contribution. And he popularized it, this Raja Yoga. Generally, three Yoga was there. Raja Yoga was not included in the whole Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Gyana Yoga. So Raja Yoga was not there actually. Afterwards, it was included in uh, the yoga uh, set. So we were discussing, uh, Hari and myself, what is the difference between Raja Yoga and Patanjali Yoga Sutta? So the, the Raja Yoga that was composed by Swami Vivekananda, Told by Swami Vivekananda. It is completely Swami's own contribution to me. This Raja Yoga is the combination of three things plus Swami's own contribution. So those three things were number one, Patanjali's Yoga Aphorism, number two, Tantra. And number three, Gyana Yoga. So Swamiji integrated Gyana Yoga, Patanjali Yoga Sutra and Tantra in Swamiji's Raja Yoga. Plus, his own contribution is the concept of Ujas and Akasha. Those are his own contributions. So he took Gyana Yoga, the ultimate goal of Raja Yoga. That is the union of Jivatman and Paramatma. That concept. Ultimate goal of Raja Yoga, Swami Vivekananda's Raja Yoga, 
is the combination of Jiva Kwan and Parma. So he took it from Gyanya Yoga. Then there is a, a function of Kundalini. So that Kundalini, uh, awakening of Kundalini, that concept he took from Tantra. And then from Patanjali he took the concept of eight limbs, you know, Ashtanga Yoga, that eight limb path. So this is the difference between uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra and there is no awakening of Kundalini in Patanjali Yoga Sutra. He took Pranayama from Patanjali Yoga Sutra. So this is the difference between Swamiji's Raja Yoga and Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Patanjali Yoga Sutra is one of the six philosophical schools of India. It is a philosophy. Uh, there are other five philosophical schools available in India. Those are the orthodox schools, uh, and two were the heterodox schools, which is called Buddhism and Jainism. So, these are the orthodox schools. And Patanjali Yoga Sutra is based on Shankha philosophy. Shankha is another philosophical school of uh, India. And although we call it yoga, now some bother. What is your concept about it? I know everyone of you knows what is yoga. What is yoga? Lovely. Union. Union. Union of what? Huh? Our self. Our self and individual self and cosmic self. Jiva and Parama. Yes. This is the union. This is called yoga. And Patanjali is a major yoga book, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So definitely in Patanjali we should have union. Yoga means union. But Patanjali is actually not yoga. It is yoga. Yoga, subtraction. There is no union in Patanjali yoga. Although it is called yoga, but it is actually separation. Why? Because it is based on Sankhya philosophy. The founder of Sankhya is Kopila. He was an outstanding personality. He was the first person in this universe under the sky who first said that there is a consciousness. He was the first person. Before him were none said that consciousness is there. So he separated consciousness and not consciousness. And this is the concept of Shankya philosophy. Shankya separated the consciousness and non-consciousness. He turned consciousness as Purusha. And non-consciousness is prakriti. So creation, the human being, everything happens when there is a combination of purusha and prakriti. When there is a combination of purusha and prakriti, then only creation. But the ultimate realization is not the creation. Ultimate realization is beyond creation. So, ultimate goal of Patanjali Yoga Sutra and Sangha Karika is the separation of Prakriti and Purusha. So, this is not a yoga, this is not union, this is actually subtraction, it is separation. Separation of Purusha and Prakriti. Do you understand that? <coughs> So this is the ultimate goal. So everyone knows yoga and yoga means union, union is Yoga But in Patanjali Yoga, which is the real yoga book, 
Jivatma and Paramatma and Yoga is Vinantara. This is the concept of Vinantara. No hai Patanjali Jo Sutra. There is a combination of Purusha and Yes, sorry. There is a combination of Jivatma and Paramatma is there. Atman concept is not there in Patanjali Jo Sutra. Only Swamiji combined in Raja Yoga this concept. So in Patanjali Yoga Sutra is separation. Separation from non-consciousness to consciousness. Purusha is the consciousness and Prakriti is the which is not consciousness. So that is the separation. <coughs> this is the fundamental basis of Patanjali Yoga Sutra. And it is also the fundamental concept of Shankhya philosophy. Now, there are two types of Shankhya philosophy. One is called Sheshwar Shankha, one is called Nirishwar Shankha. Sheshwar means Shaw, Ishwar. Ishwar is the God. So Shaw means with. So Shaw, Ishwar. It is Sheshwar Shankha, where Ishwar, the reference of Ishwar is there. That is called Sheshwar Shankha. And where there is no reference of Ishwar, that is called Nirishwar Shankha. No Ishwara. So Patanjali Yoga Sutra is also called Sheshwara Sangha. So the reference of Ishwara is there in Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Two verses we find where the reference of Ishwara is there. One in second chapter and one in first chapter. So this is in uh, brief the introduction of Patanjali Yoga Aphorism. So it is yoga based on Sarko philosophy. And actually, you should know that the root, Sanskrit root of yoga is huge. Huge means combination, huge means connection. This huge root word has three meanings. One is union, one is concentration, and other is control. In three philosophical schools, these three meanings have been used. In Vedanto, the union, the concept of union has been used. In Patanjali, the concentration has been used. And in Tantra, the control has been used. In Tantra, the yoga has been used as control. The central theme of Tantra is control. So, Yoga means their control. In Patanjali Yoga Sutra, Patanjali, the central theme of Patanjali Yoga Sutra is concentration, meditation. So the concentration has been used, the concept of concentration has been used as yoga in Patanjali Yoga Sutra. So according to yoga in Patanjali Yoga Sutra is concentration. And in Vedanta, the concept of union has been used because in Vedanta this is the union between Jivatma and Parma. So this is the uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra in brief. Then let us see how many Patanjali explanation Bhasya is there. You know, without explanation we cannot read Patanjali. Anything, any scripture we cannot read without asya, without explanation. So Patanjali is actually there are few yogas. Uh, so Patanjali's explanation is there on yoga. The uh, you know it is uh, Sankha and yoga. This Patanjali based on Patanjali. Then Savar's explanation is there. It is Jayamini Mimangshakas. Jayamini founded that 
Mimamshaka. And then Shankara's explanation is here in Brahma Sutra. So these are the few uh, Bhashyas. Papandari's Bhashya, Savara Bhashya on Mimamshaka and Brahma Sutra. Shankaracharya's uh, Bhashya is there. So this is simply background. So with Bhashyas, Patanjali is impossible. That is why there are Vyasa Bhashya on Patanjali. It is 6 to 8 AD. Then from Vyasa came Bhachaspati and Bhoja in the same line. Then Vigyana Vikshu. Then Bhavaganashan and Ramaji Bhatta. This Vigyana Vikshu was actually Buddhist monk. He explained on Patanjali Yosu. So, it is very clear that Patanjali, at one point, Patanjali Yavasutra and Buddhism, it became intermingled. You can find there are so many similarities with Patanjali Yavasutra and Buddhism. And Vyasa, <laughs> Indian scripture, can you, can you tell any one scripture, Indian scripture, where there is no Vyasa <laughs> So who was Vyasa? It was very uh, surprising thing. Are they all the same Vyasa? Or Vyasa was a kind of nickname. It was a kind of degree, you know, doctor. Doctor such and such. So maybe Vyasa was a kind of degree or maybe kind of name they used, very learned scholar. So they used to call them Vyasa. So maybe that kind also. Uh, we don't know. But everywhere there is a Vashavasya. And then came Bachaspati and Bhuja. Bhuja is a little bit different from Vyasa. But Bachaspati followed the same lineage. And Swami Vivekananda. You have seen that uh, Swami Vivekananda wrote the simple meaning of uh, Patanjali Jeva Sutra. And uh, in few verses, he explained it also. Surprisingly, Vasavasa is most popular in Patanjali Yoga Sutra. But surprisingly, Swami Vivekananda followed Bhoja Vasya. We don't know why Swami Vivekananda followed Bhoja. He did not follow Vasavasa. Vasavasa was the most popular at common. But Swami Vivekananda followed Bhoja Vasya. <coughs> so these are the commentators. <coughs> So, Bhoja differs from Vyasa. So, we will come for Bhoja's commentary in his commentary works. <coughs> Maniprabha is another composed by Ramananda Yogindra, followed by Middle Path, Vyasa and Bhoja. So, Bhoja and Vyasa is completely opposite uh, commentators. The Middle Path that was followed by Ramananda Yogindra, he followed the he was Vedantic philosopher, so he wrote explanation from the Vedantic standpoint. Towards the end of 19th century, Swami Vivekananda made first attempt to popularize Patanjali Yoga Sutra in the West. So nobody knew Patanjali about Patanjali Yoga Sutra. And he is the father of yoga. Then came Guriharananda Aranya. Actually, uh, I would suggest some of our devotees he bought that Uriyana on the Arana. I would suggest this center if you try to make your uh, library rich. Please keep one book of Uriyana on the Arana. He is the last scholar of Patanjali Yoga Sutra. He is the last one. So, and he has this. They followed the philosophical schools, you know. Those who follow the Vedantic school, they call Vedanti. Those are Nimansakas, they call Nimansaka. Those are uh, Naya, Naya school, they follow. So, Haryana Aranya, his school is Patanjali Yoga school. So, they followed the 
philosophy of Patanjali also. So, uh, and his disciple Dharma Megha Aranya, in modern times, Huryananda Aranya revived Sangha philosophy and Patanjali Aranya. He wrote Bhashyati, he mostly followed Bhachaspati. Means Vyasa. Now, Patanjali, in India, there is no psychology. In the West, the school of psychology was developed. But in India, everything is dharma, you know. No ethics, dharma. So, no philosophy, philosophy was there, but no uh, psychology, everything is dharma. So, dharma comprises everything. It is a huge big umbrella. So, what happened? Actually, Patanjali Yoga Sutra, it is philosophy, psychology and spiritual. So, it serves actually all these three things. It is a tremendous book, very, very good book. Now, <coughs> here is a uh, Four padas means four chapters. In Patanjali Yoga Sutra, there is four chapters, which is called pada. The first pada is the Samadhi pada, 51 verses. It is completely uh, Samadhi, uh, explained about Samadhi, etc. The second is the uh, Sadhana pada. The practice of Patanjali uh, Yoga Sutra. So there is 55 verse. Second chapter, Sadhana Pada. Then third chapter is the Vibhuti Pada, the psychic power. You know. Those yogis who did the uh, yoga practice, they acquire some power. So this is called Vibhuti Pada. And the last is the Kaivalya father. It is Kaivalya means who are liberated. So this, in this uh, chapter, there is a combination of whole thing actually, the whole other three chapters. So it is completely independent, isolated chapter. So self-analysis, enlightenment, 34 verses up there. So total 51, 55, 56, around 150 and 34. Means 180, like this kind of verses are there in Patanjali Yoga Sutra total. Not, not a huge book. In Bhagavad Gita, 700 verses. In Chandi, 700 verses. So this book is only 170 verses like that. Not a very big book. So I have already mentioned about the uh, things. Generally, I actually. Uh, gave this Patanjali Yoga Sutra class in our San Jose Center for six years. I took six years to uh, explain basically only two chapters the Sadhana Pada and Samadhi Pada. I did not deal with Vibhuti Pada, only just referred Vibhuti Pada, and I did not touch Vibhuti Pada. So, only uh, two chapters I taught. Uh, Six years. Uh, very profound book. I, I consider it a very profound book. And I, I, I have gone through each process, not like this. Well, now generally I start uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra from second chapter. Because first chapter is Samadhi Pada. So, we are not capable or we are not eligible to understand the Samadhi thing. The second chapter is Sadhana Pada, the practice. So we are inferior type of uh, aspirant. So we have to start from Sadhana. So that is why always I start from Sadhana Pada. And I shall come to that. The first verse of Sadhana Pada is the Kriya Yoga. So I think uh, you have understood, you have heard it. 
can you please raise your hand who has already heard about the word Kriya Yoga? Good. Do you have any idea what is Kriya Yoga? Who has the idea what is Kriya Yoga? Please tell me. Uh, the what, three steps in, in the eight steps are called Kriya Yoga. No. It is almost by, but um, not exactly three steps. The Kriya Yoga was, I don't know at all about it, but it's referenced in um, well, the self-realization people. <laughs> That's fine, but that's all I heard. Sri Krishna teaches that more. Actually, uh, for uh, very simple people, for novice people, there are two ways to start Patanjali Yosutra if you want to practice this. Some of these scholars, they say to start with Kriya Yoga, but some, they say to start with Ashtanga Yoga. So, I believe it is my personal opinion to start from Ashtanga Yoga. Because the Ashtanga Yoga, everywhere, in, in, in Vedanta, in Tantra, in Patanjali Yoga Sutra, there is an ice breaking. You know, the ice breaking, there is an ice breaking. Means some capability, some competency we have to acquire. Anybody is passing from this road and he will come and he will start some kind of practice. It is not possible. So one has to acquire some kind of competency. So these are the competency one has to acquire. As for example, uh, uh, Ashtanga Yoga. So what are the competency? Yama, Niyama, these are the first thing, you know. So they have to practice that to acquire the competency. Then only they start the uh, Kriya Yoga. So Kriya Yoga is not all the uh, uh, Ashtanga Yoga's things, Tapa. Tapa, Swadhyaya, Ishara Pradhyaya. So these are the three. Tapa is not there in... Uh, Tapas is there in Ashtanga Yama. 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 Okay. In Yama. Yama is there, Tapa. So uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, Kriya Yoga. So why we perform Kriya Yoga? I shall come to that point. But... Uh, First is Ashtanga Yoga, this is the system we have to go. First Ashtanga Yoga, then Kriya Yoga, and then Samadhi will come. So, according to Patanjali, there is the Ashtanga Yoga, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Dharana, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. So, this Samadhi, it is one Samadhi, okay? So, why then other chapters are required? If Samadhi can be attained by this Ashtanga Yoga, then why did Patanjali wrote other chapters? So, the answer is given that this is called Samadhi Matram. This is Samadhi Matram. Patanjali said, or the Vyasa says, that this is not real Samadhi. This is Samadhi Matram. And then afterwards, he explained another three types of Samadhi. So those are the different types of Samadhi. Now, to start Ashtanga Yoga, this is the system. And there are, uh, this is for ordinary person like us. 
and then the there are modern approach there are traditional approach traditional approach is that we should go by the analysis or by the commentary vyasa commentary bhoja commentary other vikana vikshu commentary all other commentaries vachaspati commentary so through all these commentaries we should go that is a traditional approach the modern approach of it is that the modern application the psychological aspect then in the modern sense they apply the psychology in patanjali yoga sutra and actually i have already mentioned that india did not have a psychology book or psychological thing so patanjali yoga sutra is the only psychology we can apply and is it actually this is very helpful actually i personally uh, like this patanjali yoga sutra and i study still now i study patanjali yoga sutra and i found that uh, there are lots of beautiful day to day application in patanjali yoga sutra actually in chicago in uh, uh, ganges i gave the retreat there and my topic my theme was this uh, how can you face the world spiritually that was my topic how can you face the world spiritually there are thousands of problems in our life how can you face that spiritually you can you can deal with those problems in different ways you can fight or flight <laughs> you can respond it in various ways you can deal with those problems but spiritually dealing with those problems is some special value so how you can do that i spoke those uh, things in retreat on the basis of bhagavad gita and on the basis of patanjali yoga sutra so i felt that patanjali yoga sutra is very helpful in practicing day to day life to solve our daily problems so that is the modern approach so two approaches are there we can do that and what is the concept of mukti or liberation in patanjali yoga sutra everywhere freedom from rebirth that is also in the patanjali yoga sutra and now always we are asked this question what is after death nachiketa's question you know everywhere that question is answered what happens after death that's a great question and no man answer has been given what is happening with the soul after death how it transmigrate how it goes from one body to another body no man has been given in brihadaranya upanishad we find a little bit hint of that what happens after death but in patanjali yoga sutra in detail it has been given it's a very very speciality of patanjali yoga sutra very clear nowhere in in the scripture in the scripture it has been dealt with a little bit it is given in kelo upanishad also but patanjali yoga sutra very clearly it has been given so this is the concept of patanjali yoga sutra is naturally get rid of the rebirth then what is the cause of rebirth oh yes it is karma phala the fruits of our work patanjali accepts that whatever you so that work that you get so that is the uh, fundamental uh, thing of karma theory so patanjali accepted karma theory like buddhism so here buddhism and patanjali has some relation some not relation some similarities uh, so i am not going to this uh, 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 slide that uh, how karma is working uh, i know you know all uh, that 
how karma gives us the fruit. I, I think you know that on those things. And actually, Patanjali worked on it thoroughly. Not physically, but psychologically. Psychologically, how a work gives us problem. Psychologically, not physically. If you just hit, give a blow on the wall, what will happen? What will happen? If I just hit it here, what will happen? Okay. Why? Reaction. Neutron's third law, isn't it? Every action has equal and opposite reaction. Newton's third law of motion. Okay. So similarly, if we work, what kind of action we get psychologically? This is physical. I hit it and I hit hard. So it is physical thing. But what happens psychologically? It has some psychological impact also. So Patanjali explained this psychological impact. And physical, psychological impact is more more intense than the physical impact. So, Papanjali explained those kind of things. And now, I am going to explain you what is this what is the exact thing? Let me go to this slide. Okay. Now, before going to this, let me explain this thing also. So, I have already mentioned that potentially based on uh, Sankha Karika, Sankha, Sankha philosophy. And the basis of Sankha philosophy is Purusha and Prakriti. So, what is Purusha? And what is Prakriti? Please, everyone. Not it is, it is Sangabada. Yeah. <laughs> the nature. What is Prakriti? Not consciousness. Not consciousness. Which is not consciousness. So, what are those things? Not consciousness. According to Sankhya, those are Satta, Tamas, and Rajas. So, Prakriti means Satta, Tamas, and Rajas. You know, you heard, you know what is Satta, Tamas, and Rajas. And in that sense, Bhagavad Gita is also based on Sankhya, don't you think? Because in Bhagavad Gita, also Prakriti means Sattva Tamas and Rajas. So Bhagavad Gita is also based on that. So according to Patanjali Yoga Sutra, Prakriti means Sattva Tamas and Rajas. And predominance of Sattva, predominance of Rajas, you know. I am not going to the Sattvatama Rajas. Who doesn't know what is Sattvatama Rajas? Can you please raise your hand? Good. So can anybody explain? What is Sattvatama Rajas? Everything is made of these three qualities. Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And uh, they mean Sattva means like if you say your own mind, if it is of sattva nature, then it's pure, peaceful. If it is rajas nature, then it's very active and restless. Tamas nature is very dull. So like that, everything in the universe is made of these things, in some combination of these things. And Indian philosophy is this, the macrocosm and the microcosm function on the same plane. What does it mean? The microcosm is individual. How individual is functioning, the cosmos is functioning in the same way. So if individual is made of Sattvatama Rajas, the non-conscious part of human being is the combination of Sattvatama Rajas. So what is the combination of <coughs> this universe? 
the non consciousness is part of this universe. Sir. Laundry? Sattva. Only Sattva? Hmm. Yes. So, exactly in the same way, the combination of this universe is Sattva Tamarajas, the non conscious part. The conscious part is called what? What is the Sanskrit name of conscious part? In Patajal, yes, Purusha. Now, <coughs> in Vedanta also, the consciousness part is called Purusha. Because Purusha and Pragati, it is very simple. The union of Purusha and Prakriti is the creation. So creation means creation of human being, creation of universe, creation of everything. So creation means bondage, creation means suffering. So the separation is the liberation. So that is what Patanjali Jagasutra is suggesting. It is a separation. Now what is the difference between Sankhya and Vedanta? Vedanta also accepts Purusha. Vedanta also accepts Purusha means consciousness. But what is the basic difference between Vedantic Purusha and Sankhya Purusha? Anybody? Plural. Eh? Sankhya is plural. Good. Plural means? <coughs> Duality. Many Purushas. Many yes. Purushas. Many, many, many Purushas. And Vedanta is only one Purusha. And another difference, another major difference? It is only Purusha. Hmm? It is only Purusha. Means? Explain it a little bit. There is only one thing. There is there isn't anything parallel to Prakriti. Mm. But then where, from where Prakriti is coming? It's in Sankhya, not right. in Vedanta. Right. Vedanta is Prakriti is also there. You have to accept Prakriti. Which is not consciousness is Prakriti. But Prakriti is not eternal in Vedanta. In Sankhya, both are real, Purusha and Prakriti. In Vedanta, yes. Prakriti in, is in, right. in Vedanta, Prakriti is coming out from Purusha. Okay. In Sankhya, Prakriti is completely independent of Purusha. Another important aspect, difference between Purusha and Prakriti, between uh, Sankhya and uh, Vedanta. So why this Purusha and Prakriti is coming very closer? So in Shankar it is said, why it combines? Because combination is the creation. So why Purusha and Prakriti is combining? It is said because it is a juxtaposition. This is coming very close together. It stays side by side. Why? Because Purusha is attracting Prakriti. It is called Chiti Shakti. So Purusha has the power, the magnetic power but in Vedanta Purusha doesn't have power also. So he it is the major difference. And there is a subtle thing. Swami Vivekananda said the manifestation of the potential divinity is called religion, isn't it? Religion is the manifestation of the potential divinity already in man. So what does it mean by manifestation? Can Purusha manifest? Can consciousness manifest? Yeah. Consciousness can manifest? I mean it's already there but it's covered. Yes, but can consciousness manifest itself? 
like it itself doesn't manifest, but it enables uh, prakriti or the tendencies or, or our intelligence mind to illuminate. In presence of presence of purusa, everything illuminates. It doesn't participate in anything. So, what does it mean manifest? Swami said manifestation. Manifest means who removes this comments. Some, some power is required to remove this. Prakriti cannot itself remove automatically. Number one. The consciousness cannot remove that because consciousness is consciousness. It has no power. Do you understand what I am saying? Mm -hmm. So please try to think this thing. This is a very intricate question. So, according to Sankhya, Purusha has this Chiti Shakti, it is Bhasha explained it as a Chiti Shakti, it has the power to attract Pranati. For attractions, the power is required. So it is called Chiti Shakti. So, that's the important thing. I should not go to those intricate point, but uh, please keep in mind and try to think that's why we have a manifestation. Prakriti cannot remove automatically. Who removed Prakriti to manifest? It is already there, but common is there. So how it can come out? If only it is removed. Who removed that? Prakriti doesn't have no power. Purusha has no power to remove this. So how to be removed? Or if it comes out automatically by his, its own power, it doesn't have power. How it will come out? So what does it mean by manifestation? Please try to understand that. Think of that. Okay. Now, I shall go So, uh, karma. This is a little bit detailed, I shall not go to this. Have you gone through uh, Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna? How many of you have gone through? Can you please raise your hand? Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. You haven't? I haven't, my God. Can you remember that there is you? No Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna? Oh my! Please go and read. Every day a little bit. Kathamrita, Kathamrita. Kathamrita in English. Have you gone through Kathamrita? So, in Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna says 24 tattvas. Can you remember that? 24 tattvas? In Sankha philosophy, 24 tattvas is not there. It is prior to Sankhya. Sankha philosophy, two tattvas are there. Yes. So before Sankhya, we Mangzaka. Okay. So, there it started with 92 tattvas. <coughs> so, in science, what happened? In science, what they are trying to do, there are four major forces, isn't it? And they are trying to bring down the four forces into one. They, they need three forces. They combine three forces, they know the source of one source of three forces, but they cannot combine other forces till now. Exactly in the same way, the ancient Indian uh, seekers, spiritual seekers, 
or seers, what they did, they consider this whole universe into 92 elements. You know, the elements are there, uh, how many, 108 now, uh, other elements also already they discovered, you know that I think. How many now, right now? They don't know. Okay. So, they divided into 92 <coughs> elements. Then they tried to bring down those things. 32, then they brought down to 24 elements. That is 24 tattvas. Means, what is the tattvas? Means, mind, senses, all these elements in this world, they made some elements the force, the energy, like that, they <coughs> call it element. So they divided into 24 elements. Then in Sankhya, those 24 elements brought down into two elements, Purusha and Prakriti. And in Advaita Vedanta, they become one. Everything is Brahman. So these people, they <coughs> could make, bring down all these elements into one. They did it. So, this is the, uh, this thing and, uh, oh. so let us start with this is basically introduction of uh, Patanjali Jyotisha. Do you have any question about this? What I am saying? Maharaj, could you speak about the psychology aspect of the Patanjali. I know, everyone is interested to that. <laughs> I am going to do that slowly, not everything. It is not possible in two classes to say everything. So, Ajay, can you please tell me what is the uh, uh, what is the work and its effect? The karma theory. Oh, you can say that? A simple way, Sri Ramakrishna says a stone drops in a pond, so the dropping of stone is the work and the ripples it causes throughout the pond is its effect on the pond. Yes, that is true. So if I do some work, what are the effects? We get the result, in it? Karma Phala. If you do evil work, you have to get the result, isn't it? If I steal something or if I kill some person, then I have to go to jail. That is something. So these are the direct effect. If I hit in this wall, I will hurt my hand. So that is also the result. No? So do you have any idea about what are, how many karmakhanas are there and how it affects on us? Two kinds, pleasure and pain. Those are karmakhana, definitely, but only pleasure and pain, there are no other effect. Anxiousness. Huh? Anxiety. Oh yes, definitely those are there. But these are the only karma phala? Long term and short term. Yes. What are the long term, what are the short term? The immediate effects and the long terms are the impressions. Okay, so what are the immediate effects <coughs> and what are the long term effects? Hmm. So immediate effect could be, for example, eating ice cream. So you feel happy immediately. But let's say if your stomach was upset, after some time you will feel upset of the stomach or you would feel increase of sugar in your blood. 
Okay. If you continuously sleep, say. Okay. So if I don't take ice cream or if I uh, don't do, in sometimes it is also found that they have diabetes. Or, or, if you believe in rebirth, so how this effect is going on? I, are you referring to uh, Sanchit Karma, Pranav Karma? Karma of Allah, everything that, that should be included there. So how many types of Karma of Allah is there? Three. So three types. Oh, what? Please tell me. Pranavta, Sanchita and Agami. Please explain those things. Sharan, what we understand is uh, something, it's like the explanation is can be, so, uh, when, so, right? Oh, okay. When the, air, that the arrow has gone from the bow, that's the Pranatkarma, you won't have any uh, power on that. It's it going to come, the effect will going to come out. Agami is something which is still uh, not developed. No, it what does it mean? Oh. Arrow, arrow is a simple example, arrow has come. How it comes to us in our life? Please give some example from our from the perspective of our life. So, when I, uh, um, so suppose we are here at the dinner and we get food. So there was some product that we supposed so to be here and we got the food. Good, good food. We got food. We got good food. Okay. Good. So that is product. That is okay. karma. Okay. Uh, Sanjit then? karma could be one that like which made us to come to this place basically. Can we do Sanjit karma? It, 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 it's like your treasure. That you are accumulated over a period of time. Accumulated and it come anytime. Any time. It can come anytime. It may come uh, right. prarabdha, will come this life only. Right. Agami karma is so the things that you are doing yes. now that would come tomorrow or whenever it has to Yes. So there are three types of karma. One is immediate karma. So I hit here and I have so this is immediate. One is prarabdha karma. You did it and the result will come in your this life. That is the prarabdha karma. And other is sanchita or agami. It has different names. Sanchita, agami, karma, sharma. So all these names are there. So that will come any time in any life. Nobody knows. And where are these karma phala accumulated? Where is the storehouse? Sanchit, the storehouse, Sanchit means. Yes, Sanchit is, also, yeah, okay. Sanchit is also like that. There are different names. Okay. In different philosophical schools, use different name. So, where they generally be accumulated? Where, where is the reservoir? Is, is it in a Karan, Karan Sarira? Now, uh, actually, authentically, he walked up here very thoroughly. He walked, so here psychological thing is coming. Where these karmophala are deposited, he said that we don't know where the karmophala are deposited. It is some unknown place we don't know. He called it karmashaya, ashaya, karma ashaya. So karmashaya, karmashaya is the huge reservoir. Where it is situated, we don't know. It has a tremendous effect in this life and in future life. So we know what is going to Pranatha is in this life. 
but authors it is very specific he mentioned that this karma shaya has a tremendous effect in your future life don't be afraid he says in three ways this karma phala is influencing in our next path and those are jati ayush and bhoga so our work in this life has a tremendous influence in our next path and these are the three areas where it will influence number one jati what does it mean by jati jati is a sanskrit word jati means when we are going to be born what body we should assume that is called jati human race so human jati race means jati so human race what kind of body we are going to assume are we going to assume human body animal body any kind of trees or something like that so please remember the work of our this life is creating some impact in our next life's body what kind of body we should assume jati ayush how long we are going to live in our like next life and bhoga bhoga means pleasure and pain experience so how what kind of bhoga what kind of pleasure and pain we will have in our next life so what is left aside nothing what kind of body how long we are going to live and what kind of experience we will have jati aisha hoga it depends upon your work in this life this time to live life so what is the way out do good work read good books it's a tremendous impact for the nations don't be afraid Patanjali says, <coughs> "This karma phala has a tremendous impact in our next life." Now he worked out how to manage this karma karma phala and karma shaya. Now the point is, now I am going to say. Now the point is, today at this very moment. we came to know that we should do good work we should think good things or we should treat good things etc etc but what we have already deposited we did lot of work and not everything is correct not everything is good so what will happen to that there are six philosophical indian school and the six have their own view anybody knows this what are the views of vaisheshika and mamsakas on this particular aspect but everyone all this is philosophical schools they accept this one <coughs> theory they accept the karma phala theory does anybody know what is the view of mimamsaka and vaisheshika they have same views so what is the uh, view of vilanta the karma phala that we have already have you are asking okay. Vedanta says, I think, when if you have the realization and understanding, there is still the inertia, so that you become like a Jeevan Mukta, what you explain, right? So still there is an inertia of that karma, yes. and that body will still keep going on. Yes. 
for that part, but there will be no extra tech, uh, another part from that. Yeah, but what about you are accumulated karma you know? fund, so you have your deposited bank money, you have some money in your bank, and now you become liberated. So what will happen with that money? How it can be dissolved? It is there in the bank. The government will take back that way. You are alive. You are Jivan Mukta. You are moving. So what will happen with that? So you it don't feel it. It will have its impact, but since you have already Jivan Mukta, you won't experience it uh, as a part of. I mean, if you have Jivan Mukta, you still have a bank account. It will help you out or whatever. Uh, yes, but actually, you enjoy and uh, actually, Adwaita is little bit hazy in this particular point. But uh, they say that bank money will be there. But as you are Jivan Mukta, you don't you don't, don't experience that thing. It doesn't matter. But it has some impact. Probably yes, probably not. But you cannot experience that thing because you are Jivan Mukta. You will not accumulate new. You cannot accommodate you, but I am talking about the yes, old no. So this is their view. Now, what are the views of Vaisheshika and Vivaakshika? So Vaisheshika and Vivaakshika view is that they say that you have to experience that. No way. Okay. Even if you are Jivan Mukta. Even if you are Jivan Mukta, you have to experience that. That will come to you. You have to experience that. Because you did that. Exhausted. Unless it will be exhausted. So it is Vaisheshika and Vivaakshika. So what is the view of Sankha and Vyasa from Yoga? Sankha and Yoga. So what is the uh, their view? They say that if you can destroy the Karma Shaya, then you are. So, how to destroy this karma? That is the whole philosophy of Patanjali Yoga Sutra. How you can destroy Patanjali Yoga Sutra <laughs> is not exercise. Unfortunately, Patanjali Yoga Sutra is not the exercise. See how many philosophies we bought in Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Okay. So, uh, Patanjali says that you have to destroy the karma shaya. So you know what is karma shaya. Now I am coming. What's the time now? Please tell me. How long we have this session? Five minutes. So Five more minutes? Yeah. Okay. So I shall take up this in the next session. So this is very important thing. This is the main fundamental thing of Patanjali Yoga Sutra that how to destroy this karma shaya because karma shaya has a tremendous impact in our future life and those are three can you remember those three what are those jati jayo yes so these are the three important aspects very careful now how these kleshas are generated that is the question how it can be generated? It is being generated from our work. What we do? Now I shall take up this point in the next session. How this karmapala <coughs> is deposited in the huge storehouse of Karmashaya and what is going to happen. These are the psychological part and practical also. Do you have questions? <coughs> yes. Will you take some questions now? That's my first question. Sure. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes. Okay. Um, I know you have questions because you didn't have to ask any questions. But I am sure others, do you have any questions? Yes. So there is an affirmative action going on. <laughs> Anybody who has not asked a question should I ask, should ask because a question. I have I have taken those questions from time to time. You have question. Yeah. Okay. In 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 first part. Okay. Is it good? Give it. Ayush. He's one of the three. This topic for you. Come up. Come. So in close.
just now you mentioned about Mimansa Kaya Vedanta. Mimansa Kaya Vedanta philosophy for the Sanchit Kaya. But it looks same to me actually. Well, because in Mimansa Kaya you said you have to go through. You have to experience, although you are Jivan Mukta or whatever. Way. You have to experience. But Vedanta doesn't say that. Vedanta <coughs> said if you are Jivan Mukta, it is fine. Yeah. So, so in in that case, the the, the 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 definition is same, but the definition of Jivan Mukta is same for different for Mimansa and Vedanta. For Mimansa, Jivan Mukta is someone who is experiencing those things. For Vedanta, Jivan Mukta is someone. Even the things that are happening, it's no, like who realized Brahman? It is Jivan. Yeah. So it's like a person is standing on the road. In the first one, the person is seeing the road, cars are going by and observing everything. And in the second one, person is standing on the road, but he doesn't care if the car is coming or going. Basically. So for the first one, I think Mimansaka is the first one, and Vedanta is the second one. That who has the experience, even though he's standing on the road. So the difference is in the definition of Jimukta for both. No, the experience should be for both. It's the discussion which is more important. One should be totally discussion. No, the point is that then I have to explain what is the concept of liberation according to Mimamsaka and according to Vedanta. So that, <laughs> that is, but you know, yes, I can explain you that thing particularly. But uh, that is not our subject matter. Our okay. subject matter is Patanjali okay. Joseph. Okay. Okay. Anyway, but the point is that Nimamshaka. Nimamshakas are the ritualistic person. They follow the karma karta of yeah. these are the Nimamshakas. So for the Nimamshakas, that this uh, Havan and all these, these <coughs> are the important part. So that will go there if you perform yaga, if you do that, if you do that, do's and don'ts, mm. then you will be liberated. Yeah. But for <coughs> Vedanta, if you realize Brahman, then only you will be liberated. So these are the two different things. So as they are karma kandi, Nivakshakas are the karma kandi, so they always try to follow that, yes, what, what work you do, so you have to experience that, you have to go through that. that is No. You are the gate. They can't take the second. And something is wrong with the microphone. Look, hold it close to you. So you said about you quoted Swami Vivekananda, where you said religion is the manifestation of potential divinity within human being. And then you raised a question that okay, Purusha is is covered. No, I said uh, uh, how this manifestation is going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How will Prakriti go away basically? If Purusha is not making effort, uh, yes, yes, and and how Purusha is coming out? If yeah, if, if his covering is not going, either cover has to go, yeah, or Purusha has to come yes, out. Yes, yes. In both the cases, there will be uh, some kind of energy, some kind of power, some kind of activities required. But we know consciousness doesn't have any kind of activity, anything else. Yes. So, what is the explanation? So, okay, I, I I don't know the right answer, but a story from Gospels is popping up in my mind when you said this thing. And Sri Ramakrishna was explaining about the Sattva, Tamas and Rajas to someone. And he said, it's like there are three robbers who looted you. And one of them was too bad that he said, I want to loot and kill this person. <laughs> and the other was, no, 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 just loot this person and tie to the tree. And the third person was a good person who said, oh, we have looted him. Now let us take him back to his home uh, so that he could be, he could take rest and all those things. So I think, as you mentioned, that within Prakriti, there are Sattva, Tamas and Rajas. These transforms basically. So for example, when the Tamas is extreme, so the covering is dense basically over there. So from the Rajas, the covering still becomes uh, thinner. And when it goes to the Sattva, even though it's also evil, it has an evil side, but it leads to the transformation that it says that, okay, we have looted this person enough, but let th make it go back to its home. The home could be a Purusha to, trans to let that person 
uncover or get rid of that. Purusha is nothing. Purusha is no neither home nor I mean, Purusha is attached. Purusha is completely attached. Purusha has no function. So what is your question? It's your question. Your question. The bad news is Maharaj that I have three questions <laughs> and uh, question uh, but I will try to tell all of them and you answer any of it. The first question is which always bothers me that there is this total bank account which you call Sanjit Karma we call out of which out of that bank something we start in this life which has to happen in this life called Pradapta. Who decides how much of the Sanjit will be used up in this life in the Pradapta? Secondly even as I do work, there is I am collecting karmas. And you said that as some of the karmas are immediately active, like you hit and you got the answer. But at the another time you are saying they are all being contributed to the bank for future. So who decides which of the karmas will have immediate result in this life versus they will go to the savings account, bad or good or whatever. And the third question I have is that if in all of this journey, whether it's through the, as I understand, Vedanta, Vedanta I understand a little like they burn up, you ask how it is burned up, they, somewhat I heard that they are like seeds which would give birth to other plants in future, but if you burn the seeds in this life, they will not be any useful seeds and all of that. But even if there are six philosophies, the truth has to be one. And intellectually I can justify this versus this versus this, but it cannot, all of them cannot be true. Uh, unlike what Sri Ramakrishna says, both Sakar and the Dakar can be the same, it's just at the end, it's just one thing. I, if you have time, I don't know if you will have time, eventually if you could tell us that, you know at the end of the day all of them are saying the same thing. I don't know if that's even a goal of Indian philosophy. So that's the least important of the three questions. But the first one was about Prabhupada, the second one was about this life. Oh yeah, this is, I would, uh, I also have some bad news for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I am unable to answer your first two questions in this session, but definitely I would address those in this uh, second session. Yay. So, this is one point. And third question actually I could not understand very clearly what uh, is your third question. So for my uh, understanding goes on that um, actually six schools are very different. Uh, and so I don't think Sri Ramakrishna also Swami Vivekananda they, they, they try to do a hodgepodge or some kind of uh, you know um, making a salad kind of thing. No, they did I not do that. I did not mean that. What I said was just like until Sri Ramakrishna, we all fought about um, these three, for example, uh, Dvaita, dualism, Vishishta Dvaita, Advaita, and within dualism we have 800, we have 33 million gods and so on. So Sri Ramakrishna, if I understood it a little, is that these are depending on the how your taste is, how mother cooks different food for different people and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it is all one, depending on nobody is wrong, nobody is right and so on. I am not saying that they also said that the six philosophies will be the same. I am saying is there any philosophies have this dangerous thing of being intellectually satisfying meaning nothing also. It could be. Uh, just like the many Western philosophies are intellectually beautiful, but may, may not have to do an experimentation. So I'm, my, my request or my quest is, do these six Indian philosophies which we hear about, is there a way of saying that actually you know they are different ways of looking at what real is, or are they six intellectual exercises? No, no, no. They are completely different six intellectual exercises. And every, all the philosophical schools have contribution in the human life. Okay. They were completely very powerful, uh, very, very powerful philosophical schools. Not only simple intellectual jugglery, but they have the living uh, 
spiritual contribution also. But unfortunately, by the passage of time, the Nimamshakas and Vaisheshikas, those right now are only dead philosophy. Uh, only the Advaita Vedanta is the living philosophy and now actually Swami Vivekananda tried to spread this Patanjali Jaya Sutra but now especially in the west not in the east especially in the west now Patanjali Jaya Sutra is also becoming the living philosophy slowly slowly it is becoming but uh, otherwise all the philosophy definitely they have tremendous impact in human life but unfortunately they are not being practiced because it is not possible for nowadays to practice Dasasamed Yajna or Kutreshtikama Yajna or Jyotishtama Yajna so those all kind of fire sacrifices is not possible because of so many reasons so that is why they are now becoming dead philosophy and dead practice but each and everything definitely it has a tremendous impact. Thank you for answering the third one and I will look forward to the other two. Okay, so break for out of the end of this? 6.30 is the oh, end.